Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. I thank you so much for listening today. Uh, first, I want to apologize a little bit for my voice. It's a little bit hoarse, and in all honesty, that's why I missed uh, an episode last week. So uh, that was my first miss in probably two and a half or three years. So again, I apologize for the voice being a little scratchy, but I definitely didn't want to uh, skip two weeks and uh, make you guys think I, I disappeared here. So um, anyway, always go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, go get that free 31-page PDF of the top 200 drugs. Great resource whether you're a student or practicing clinician. Uh, and of course, support our sponsor, meded101.com slash store. All right, so the drug of the day today is oxycodone, which I have not uh, covered yet, which is kind of surprising to me as I was looking through my list. Uh, brand name of this medication, uh, the extended release product is oxycontin. Uh, that's often a, a term you'll hear, a, a street term as well that you'll hear used. Um, this medication is an opioid and it is uh, oral only. So comparing that to like morphine where we've got a ton of different dosage forms, uh, oxycodone uh, only comes as an oral agent. Uh, at least that's uh, commercially manufactured. Uh, so like I mentioned, it's an opioid analgesic. Just a refresher, mechanistically, um, this drug will bind opioid receptors in the brain and central nervous system, and that's going to block those pain signals from getting to the brain. So essentially, this doesn't allow the patient to uh, perceive pain or at least perceive it to a significant extent. They recognize that they may be hurt or injured, whatever the case may be, um, but their brain doesn't allow them to perceive those pain signals coming to the central nervous system. So uh, again, it doesn't really uh, uh, reduce inflammation at the site of the pain or whatever the case may be, um, but it actually just blocks the signals. So what do we use this for? It's going to be an analgesic. It's going to be used to relieve pain. Uh, oxycodone is one of the most commonly used drugs uh, post-op when people go home, for example. So, uh, you know, if you have a surgery, if you have a, you know, severe injury, that type of thing, um, oxycodone certainly can be utilized to help manage that pain. Occasionally, I do see it used chronically for chronic pain patients uh, with all the challenges with the opioid crisis and things like that. We're seeing um, a shift away from chronic opioid use because there are tons of risks uh, to long-term opioid use, of course. Uh, it is a controlled substance, risk of addiction dependence. That's why we really want to do our best uh, to try to avoid using these agents for long periods of time. That risk of dependence, physical dependence, can develop within a couple of weeks. So that's really, really important to remember. And I remember when I first uh, graduated school, you would see prescriptions for 90 oxycodone, 180 oxycodone after surgeries. And that's obviously scary, and that gets them to that point of they're going to become physically dependent on that medication if they use everything that they're given. So let's say you take a, a prescription of 90 oxycodone, you take three a day, and all of a sudden, you've got 30 days worth. So that patient is likely going to be physically dependent upon opioids at the end of that time period. So that's why we're getting away from you know trying to use those opioids as minimal as possible, very short durations right after surgery, three, five days, and you know not much beyond a week if we can at all help it. So that's kind of the, the shift back. And... <clears throat> With the uh, adverse effect profile and with the risk of dependence, we've got to recognize some of those signs and symptoms. So let's first talk about direct side effects from the drug. And oxycodone is going to cause sedation and primarily the risk of uh, opioid overdose, oxycodone overdose, is respiratory depression. Okay, And we have a boxed warning for that. So if patients take too much of it, 
that's going to be the risk and can ultimately lead to death if that uh, intake is high enough for that patient. Uh, other adverse effects, risks, um, GI upset can happen, nausea, um, constipation. Certainly you have to be aware of opioids are likely going to cause that. Uh, other maybe less common things, itching can happen. Um, sometimes drop in blood pressure can happen. Usually in our ambulatory patients, it's probably not too big a deal, but maybe in patients that are a little bit more sensitive, maybe hospitalized patients, maybe that drop in blood pressure um, could be a little bit more uh, clinically significant there. Now, I do want to mention withdrawal uh, because I have seen this overlooked for sure. Uh, withdrawal symptoms, you can have uh, sweating, achiness, um, new onset anxiety, insomnia, uh, runny nose, uh, kind of this um, wet eyes or tearing up of the eyes as well can happen. Uh, GI upset, diarrhea, tachycardia, increase in blood pressure. So these are lots of potential symptoms. And in working with patients uh, who have been physically dependent upon opioids and trying to taper them down, uh, I've definitely seen a lot of these. I would say sweating is probably one of the more common ones I've seen. Um, but you can also see some of those other ones as well. And clinicians, if they're not thinking about what medications a patient has been taking or maybe what medications they've just stopped, they might not recognize that these are signs of opioid withdrawal. And it may be difficult to get that out of a patient if they're defensive about that they were on opioids or taking opioids or that type of thing. So um, really, really important to look at that. And if you see some of those um, trigger symptoms and you know maybe they had recent pain issues, recent surgery issues, you sh definitely should be inquiring about the use of opioids and the stoppage or discontinuation of opioids. Okay, So really, really important to think about that from our, our patients' perspectives. I wanted to mention kinetics a little bit. Uh, so immediate release, the onset of action is 10 to 15 minutes. So certainly that can be really beneficial in patients that need acute pain relief right now. Uh, with the immediate release, uh, that peak analgesia is probably going to be in, in the ballpark of an hour, you know, 30, 30 to 60 minutes, but that onset can happen pretty quickly with the uh, oral oxycodone. Uh, three to six hour duration. So you'll often see oxycodone orders uh, every, you know, four to six hours kind of as needed for acute pain management. Uh, and then from a kinetic standpoint, I also wanted to mention the enzymes that may impact breakdown of the drug. So CYP3A4 and CYP2D6 may cause some alterations in the kinetics, uh, in the uh, metabolism side of kinetics for oxycodone. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and I'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification to study material like ambulatory care, BCM TMS, BCPS, BCGP, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. We've got a great list of resources there, complete packages, practice questions, uh, review videos, a uh, whole list of resources that's meant to uh, entirely cover you for those exams and help you uh, really prepare to pass those exams. So go support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Uh, if you're another healthcare professional, maybe a nurse, physician, student of any sort, um, we've got links to Amazon books like Perils of Polypharmacy, drug interaction books, case study books, uh, all those can be found at meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, so let's finish up on drug interactions. The first thing you should think about with oxycodone and any opioids, in my opinion, is CNS depressant risk, okay? So there are lots of drugs that can add on to that risk. So I think about uh, Z drugs for sleep, so like your Zolpidem, for example, benzodiazepines, your Ativans, your Xanaxes, things like that, uh, alcohol, uh, antihistamines, skeletal muscle relaxants, lots of different medications that can cause CNS depressant type effects, 
and have additive effects and may increase the risk for opioid overdose. Okay, so really, really important to think about that, uh, gauge that risk and assess that risk with your patient, looking at their other medications and what they may take uh, over the counter, as well as alcohol intake too. Uh, next, I do mildly think of CYP3A4. Um, that's probably the main one I would think about. So if you've got a CYP3A4 inhibitor, that is one of the pathways that oxycodone is broken down by. So if you've got a CYP3A4 inhibitor, that's going to likely increase concentrations of oxycodone. Okay, That might make it more at risk for adverse effects and potential overdose uh, if patients are kind of right on that borderline. Uh, inducers of CYP3A4 um, may make it more likely that patients don't respond to oxycodone. Maybe that drug doesn't work as well for them. Well, maybe they're on a CYP3A4 inducer. Um, CYP2D6 does have some impacts there, uh, so that's something to, to maybe think about. Um, but CYP2D6 actually converts oxycodone to oxymorphone, which has analgesic activity as well. So um, that gets a little bit more complicated. One other point with these enzymes I wanted to mention was if you've got genetic testing available and you know that a patient is a poor or rapid metabolizer at one of these, that could alter concentrations of oxycodone. So very important to think about that, assess that, and how that might affect your patient's response to a drug like oxycodone. Uh, lastly, as far as drug interactions go, uh, I did want to mention that these meds, opioids, can slow down the gut. So if you've got a patient that's being uh, treated for gastroparesis with a drug like metoclopramide, for example, um, oxycodone is really going to kind of oppose or blunt the effect of the prokinetic agent. Now, this isn't an all-inclusive list, of course, as far as drug interactions go, but those are some of the really big highlights, uh, I think some of the most important memorizable facts uh, that you need to know. So that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a rating, review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. That's greatly appreciated. Um, go subscribe, get that free PDF at reallifepharmacology.com. And of course, support our sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Your purchases there go directly to help fund this podcast. You can track me down, LinkedIn, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCGP, BCPS, or mededucation101 at gmail.com. And again, I apologize a little bit for my voice. I'm hoping if we uh, give her a few more days or another week or two here, uh, that voice will be uh, shaping up a little bit better. So... Uh, thank you for listening. Take care and I hope you have a great rest of your day.